Welcome to the Health Leader Forge. My name is Mark Bonica, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the University of New Hampshire. Today's guest is Dr. Neil Meehan, the Chief Physician Executive of Exeter Health Resources. Dr. Meehan is a board-certified emergency medicine physician and was the driving force behind the creation of the New Hampshire Physician Leadership Development Program, a joint effort between the New Hampshire Medical Society, the New Hampshire Hospital Association, and the University of New Hampshire. In this podcast, we discuss Dr. Meehan's own journey from living in a music studio above a peanut butter factory through medical school, residency, and his own development as a physician leader. We discuss in detail what the medical school and residency experiences are like because the New Hampshire Physician Leadership Development Program has a unique flavor based on Dr. Meehan's own experience of medical training as well as his observations about how physician training creates some specific challenges for physicians who want to transition from lead clinician to clinician leader. I have been a part of the physician leadership program since its inception, so it was fun to talk with Neil and capture some of the stories and insight that I have heard him share over the last few years. I hope you enjoy this interview, and if you do, won't you leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It helps other people find us. Thanks for listening, and here is Dr. Neil Meehan. Welcome to the podcast, Neil. Thanks for having me, Mark. So this is a lot of fun. We've been working together for a long time on a physician leadership training program that you you founded. And uh, I'm excited to talk about your thoughts on leadership today. And you're a physician and you have some thoughts on the advantages and challenges of transitioning, uh, of a physician transitioning to leadership roles. So I thought we'd start by talking about your journey becoming a physician and um, kind of, and, and then talk a little bit about that that second stage of your journey becoming a physician leader. So I, I wanted to start by asking you, when did you have the idea that you would like to be a physician? What inspired you to pursue that? Um, well, it, it was a, a bit longer journey than most, I think. When I, I was in, you know, through junior high school and high school, I was pretty academically inclined. I did well. I was part of the National Honor Society and all that. And I also uh, was uh, interested in a few other things. I had a real passion for music. And I think at some point I was very much uh, inclined towards music in a, in a career um, in uh, recording and engineering. And I had all kinds of different interests in the, in the musical field. But my other passion was in EMS. Uh, early uh, in, my, in my early years, I guess, starting about 18, maybe, I became an EMT. And that opened up this whole new world of, uh, I don't know, excitement and urgency. And I found out that I was pretty good at that job. Um, I was uh, sort of at, at some point, you know, like all EMTs, a bit of a deer in the headlights. And, you know, you're, you're kind of shocked by the urgency and the emergency of things. But after a while, I, I began to understand how to remain cool under pressure, how to think during a crisis. And I also uh, felt like I, I had a good skill set, both clinically and, and probably with um, some mental fortitude. And, and, uh, and I was working with great people and, and excellent role models at the time. And there was a, as a intense camaraderie in EMS as well. So uh, a lot of my uh, sort of social connections were built in, in there as well. So I had these two competing passions in, in my life. And I was uh, fortunate enough to get into Boston College, which was a good school at the time. And when I graduated my, with my undergraduate degree in biology, I was in a pre-med program, but I decided that I would take some time off to explore uh, music. Mm-hmm. And also, um, I worked uh, full-time in EMS as well. And I think eventually, what I found out is that you know, making a career in music is really difficult. Uh, right. it, it takes... Um, more than just passion, it, it takes uh, a dedication of your whole life and a lot of risk. I mean, you know, we were, we had a small studio in Everett and we were 
putting bongo tracks on at four in the morning for free nice. uh, because a lot of my customers couldn't pay. And uh, it was real sustenance living at that point. And uh, so you actually had a business. So, can I ask that you actually oh, yeah. had a, you, so you had like, you had a recording studio and you were charging people to record. So this was a, yeah, so, yeah, so, exactly. Oh, wow. okay. it, Neat. It was an Everett at the Teddy, if you know, I'll take people back a while, but it was at the <laughs> Teddy peanut butter uh, warehouse. So we okay. were sharing warehouse space and uh, with, typically with every day about company. 12 o'clock, nice. the whole place was full of peanut butter smoke. And um, <laughs> but luckily we recorded most, most bands at night. Uh -huh. And so I was a bit of a night owl because I was working nights in EMS as well. So okay. I tend to be a, wow. a, a night person in general. And um, that uh, whole gig was about uh, two or three years when I really decided to get back into it. And I, um, you know, it, it, I would say that there was a lot of self-motivation that I needed then to get back into it because I had to prep for the uh, MCATs, which is a standard exam to um, get into medical school. And so I did a lot of sit down preparation for that over the course of a year before I felt capable of uh, really performing on the MCATs. And uh, all the while, again, working full time in EMS and trying to have a, a studio, I, I basically had two full time jobs. So, um, so you had uh, a studio. You know, I gotta, I gotta ask about the music a little <laughs> bit. So, so okay, so because sure. we've never, we've actually never. I've, I know you were, you're still in a band even. So, uh, but I've, we've never actually talked about this. So I gotta know, what do you play? What kind of, sure. what, what do you, what's your instrument? Or are you like, are you the, like lead yeah. singer? What do you, what do you do? Yeah, sure. So I um. I started out at a very early age playing guitar. I, I think my mother got me lessons at the YMCA at the age nice. of about five or six. And then I continued right through, uh, you know, all the way really through high school and uh, in and out of, um, I really just cover bands and uh, a mm -hmm. few original okay. bands. And then I really had a passion for the recording elements of and, and recording production and engineering of music, because I'm also a bit of a techie as well. So it was a good yeah. marriage between the two. And uh, I began to get into recording personally, you know, I just wanted to record myself and uh, you know, uh, my band. And then uh, that grew into a small business where we had a uh, eight track analog studio with, and it was right on the cusp of digital music production. Wow. So we had a two track, a digital mastering system as well, which was uh, a bit of a differentiator for us in that very small market, but not enough to uh, make a great living at it. Okay. All right. So you, so, so at what, so what was the, what was the kind of culminating moment when you decided I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I've given it a shot and I'm going to, I'm going to shift my gears and go start studying for the MCAT, like you were starting to say. So I think, <laughs> I don't know if there was a moment, yeah. but there was probably a moment where I got the lifestyle of, of, it's hard to explain this, but you know, well, let me paint you a picture. I was living in the studio itself uh, in a windowless <laughs> warehouse uh, and All taking right. showers at my mother's house uh, nice. and um, eating out of uh, what was the only thing there to cook with, which was a pressure cooker. So you can imagine after a, that, that can get tiresome after a bit, although I loved the music. I, I just loved right. doing what I did, uh, but maybe not enough to, uh, you know, sort of maintain that the lifestyle. And, and also I could foresee a future in emergency medicine already since I was in EMS uh, to start. Yeah. So that was also a competing passion. But what made you decide? So like, so you're doing the EMS. I mean, I get the EMS thing. Like what made you decide to do, to go to medical school though, as opposed to maybe become a paramedic or, cause you could make a career in, in, in that, on that side. Was yeah. there, did you get a chance to see, get to know EMS docs or what was it that, that made you decide medical school? Well, I, I think a few things. One is I knew when I, when I, when I graduated, that I would eventually like to go back to school. I just didn't know okay. when I wanted to explore okay. music a bit. So I, that was sort of always uh, maybe in the back of my mind. Uh -huh. And then I did uh, have several partners who were getting into medical school and they were coming back excited. They were working summers in between first and second year. And I could see myself doing mm. that. And mm -hmm. uh, again, I had academic success as well. So mm -hmm. given all of that, 
I was also, you know, disappointing my own dad who <laughs> had great uh, ideas of his son being a, a physician at some point. And, you know, there's emotional aspects, there's familiar yeah. aspects. And I think there's also the self-actualization piece that when I saw other people, uh, you know, uh, I, mm-hmm. I think I saw myself. And, and when I, uh, I think there was probably three or four of my partners began to build their careers in medicine. And at that point, I just couldn't help myself. And I, I studied and, and eventually got into medical school. Well, that's neat. So so you gave up that that exciting life of living in a windowless room in your in your um <laughs> in your business, eating out of a pressure cooker. Nice. I I I can't see why you'd want to give that up. Uh so, so you went to so you went to medical school. At some point. <laughs> and, and, yeah. yeah. So you so you so went to medical, to medical school. school. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so medical school is, you know, I think for a lot of people, medical school is kind of a black box. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what is what was it like? Was it like what you expected? You know, what was the experience? Yeah, that, uh, it, it is hard to explain. Let, let me tell you the mental attitude I went with and then what I ended with. Mm. So, you know, again, just to bring you back, I, I was living in a windowless apartment in a, in a <laughs> warehouse with a pressure cooker. Yeah. So when yeah. I went to medical Peanut school, butter smells. Yeah. I, Exactly. Right. So I, um, I didn't know any better. So I, um, didn't have a place to live and I, I packed, packed up all my stuff in a, in a U-Haul. I got out there and realized that all the apartments had been taken. So I, um, I know this sounds crazy, but I lived in the back of my U-Haul for the first four or five days, uh, when I got out there because I was so (laughs) ill prepared for, you know, what is the real life like and what it is to prepare and, and, uh, have my ducks in a row and so eventually I met um, some other students who invited me to live in their apartment. And so I lived on their couch for a few weeks. So the beginning of medical school was just pure chaos, a social chaos to me. Mm. Um, but I will tell you when I, um, when I got there, and I don't have any explanation for this, something in my brain clicked as soon as I got into the classroom setting. So the first year of medical school, is uh, really drinking information, and, and, you know, really, uh, you know, anatomy and biology and, and, mm. and, and pharmacology, but drinking all of that from a fire hose. I would think of trying to do four semesters in college at once or having three times the amount of credits that you would normally uh, take on uh, during a semester or some, some way to try and, you know, sort of explain the overwhelming amount of information that you're expected. So I went from college and studying, you know, an hour a night, maybe over the weekend, I might spend, I might even stay up overnight for a test once in a while to literally leaving the classroom uh, in medical school at about maybe two, two o'clock in the afternoon and sitting in the library till 12 every night, every Mm -hmm. night without, without fail with the very few exceptions of some socialization I did with my uh, medical school classmates. So that type of work ethic, it, it, it was, it, it was clearly required. And I, I think I, I adapted to that really quickly. And I found that um, I, it, I was really successful there as well in, in medical school, at least for the academic pieces, I, I graduated first in my class. Um, I became sort of, I I think a a model for some of the other students who are also in the same position. I mean, in fact, they had maybe three years less of life experience than I did. Um, but it was a very self-actualizing space for me to be in, to be that pressured and receive that much information. And I realized that part of it was, um, it was all the information was so oriented what you'll be doing in your career. There was no wasted space, you know, and, and I don't, I don't want to knock anything about liberal arts education. I, 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 sure. I think that that's everything that's necessary for a human to feel uh, whole. But when you get to medical school, there is no wasted time in the targeted learning that you need to do. So everything I learned seemed pertinent and it felt like every fact was going to make me a better physician. So 
you know, that directedness also gave me motivation to, to, uh, I think, just change my whole lifestyle Mm -hmm. and, uh, and feel so utterly, I mean, really completely committed to, uh, consuming every bit of knowledge that I possibly could. And, you know, the pressure is really unbelievable. I mean, every test feels high stakes. Um, mm. there's, uh, also a final test and, you know, everything you sort of remember about finals in college, it felt like it was finals in college every day in medical school. And <laughs> I think in, in some way, it, it, I, I, I know this is really cliche, but unless you go through that amount of academic pressure, it's, it's hard to fathom. And, and so that was the first two years. And uh, again, it, it's mainly di- uh, 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 academics and, and you also do get in the second year some practical experience by going into, say, a doctor's office and, and whatnot. And eventually, uh, if it's okay to move on to the third year, yeah, you get yeah. into um, your clinicals. Mm-hmm. And so you've got these two years of really good basic science behind you. And then you move into your clinicals, which you immediately realize all the science could have goes out the door. And now it's a whole new element uh, of uh, a whole new uh, uh, category of, of learning. And mm-hmm. yes, you know, you reach back on some of the basic sciences, but you realize that they have not done anything to help you manage and, and assess and diagnose and treat in clinical situations. Well, that's, so, it, well, that's um, interesting because you just said, you were saying like everything in those first two years felt like it had a purpose. And now I'm kind of hear you saying, well, maybe, maybe not. Or, or you say, what are you saying there? Like, like it builds yes on and it? No. Yes and no. So let me give you a, for instance, um, mm. you know, you being in finance, it would be mm-hmm. like, okay, we've taught you everything you can know about debits and credits. Right. And you are excellent at putting together a T-sheet or, a, yeah. you know, a, a T-table. T-table and yeah. uh, you know how the numbers move back and forth. And now you go, you go to manage an organization. Right. And then you have 20 people below you and, you know, <laughs> multiple personalities. And you're trying to figure out the, the budgets of those people and the idiosyncrasies. And you're trying to lead teams. And, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I just... I. I've only learned about the debits and credits here. I mean, you know, <laughs> right. There's I so much more. I to lead an organization. Yeah. There's yeah, so yeah. much more. <laughs> now, without the debits and credits, you don't have the language to even right. speak. So you've right. got to have it. Right. But when you, what you realize is that that is just the beginning. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole new world of clinical acumen that you are trying to build off of that foundation. But it is completely different in a way yet connected. Um, so when I see somebody now, I don't go back to the Krebs citric acid cycle and I, uh, I, uh, don't, uh, you know, try and think of my, uh, receptor pharmacology. And what I do is I am able to understand the concepts and then apply them in a, in a clinical way. Uh, when I recognize patterns in people, when I hear histories and it's not as if I, would remember the absolute biochemistry of this, but it was absolutely necessary for me to make that leap into clinical medicine. And the two, like, you know, they do coexist at some point, but I would say that, uh, again, the world of actual clinical medicine is very, very different or, or much different than I expected when I got into, um, when I, when I sort of left my academic two years to start. Mm. So it was a bit shocking for me. I, yeah. I think that that's true for everybody, by the way, I, I unless they're, you know, uh, maybe had been a nurse for a long time or a physician's assistant that, that got a lot of this, but just coming from EMS, you know, I had such a small piece of the pie, uh, as experience that I, I, um, probably didn't fathom the amount of, uh, clinical acumen I, I really needed to, to be a great physician. And that's what they build in you over the next two to five to seven years, depends on how, how long you right. go into this. In fact, I would sort of call it the difference between classroom and then really the apprenticeship starts sometime after the uh, second year. And the other component to that is uh, you're still learning, uh, you know, just because you've been through the first two years of academics doesn't mean you're not still learning the academics. So you'll go see someone with uh, you know, a thyroid disorder or someone who has an infectious disease that you want to read about. And you will have to go back and, and, and actually study that 
the pathophysiology of that, the treatment of that. So you're constantly in the clinical setting and at night spending time reviewing and trying to you know learn about what you've seen because either one, it was not in depth enough at the two year level or two, it, it may, may not even, you may not have seen it. They can't possibly teach every disease and every confluence of diseases and, you know, then throw in social situations, everything else that you would be expected to deal with even at the you know third and fourth year level. So a lot of, um, a lot of what you're uh, sort of seeing clinically during the day, you're then reading about and learning about at night as well. So the, the learning didn't, you know, it, it sort of almost layered on top of itself. So this second year is just as busy as the first year. In fact, you're spending, I mean, look at there's limits now to what, you know, students and residents can, can um, do as far as hours per week. But mm-hmm. I'm going back to when there were no limits and I'd spend, you know, hundred hours uh, in clinical a week. Right. And then maybe the rest of the time, if I'm not sleeping, just learning about it. So again, it was, um, it's hard to fathom the um, amount of dedication that one needs in order to uh, successfully navigate medical school. So the, so the, the, the second half of medical school, you said were in clinicals. And so that was like, you're doing rotations through all the different specialties. Is that, isn't that right? Yeah, exactly. And, right. And, and so part of that is to expose you to all the different aspects of medicine, but part of it is also to prepare you to pick what you want to go to when you go to residency. That, that's correct. So uh, a lot of folks enter medical school um, not really knowing what medical specialty they want, and, and they just they know they want to be a doctor and, uh, and you know, sort of have that sort of noble intent about their life, but they, they get exposed and, and they make their decisions. And I think some people sort of halfway through figure that out, and then they there is a little bit of flexibility in how you how you set up your your, your fourth year so that you may be able to concentrate a little bit more in those areas that you're interested in, mm-hmm. which is which is what I did because I was a I don't know if I'm in the minority or not, but certainly I don't think everybody was like this. I knew where I wanted to go before I went to medical school, before I even applied. I knew I wanted to be in yeah. emergency medicine. If there was an emergency medicine, I'm not, not sure I would have been in medicine. Okay. Okay. So, so I was yeah. able to focus pretty early on. So you knew, I mean, you, but I, I mean, I've talked to a fair number of your, in particular of your colleagues about, you know, and a lot of, uh, a lot might be an overstatement, but a number of, of young people that wind up going to medical school have kind of a similar background to you. They do some, some time as an EMT. But and they might go in thinking, yeah, I'm going to do EMS, but they don't actually follow through. What was it that you know, I mean, like you didn't get entranced by GI or you know one of the other? Did did you have a like an affair with one of the other ones before you before you you know came back home to emergency or were you always it just never went out of your sights that you were going to be an emergency in emergency? No, you know what? That's a really good question. I would say that. I was in love with emergency medicine. My father mm-hmm. was a, a police officer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, the, the police, the lights, the blue siren. I mean, there's all this sort of, you know, that sort of uh, sexiness to it in a way mm-hmm. um, that may have, I guess, influenced me. But really, I, I really felt I was self-actualized when you're at an emergency and somebody is really ill or really injured, or Mm -hmm. there's, there's a a crisis of an emotional crisis of, of even several patients at once. I just felt in a comfort zone that I I don't think, I think a lot of people are in there. That's not their comfort zone, right? You know, they, they don't, I'm not saying anybody would run from an emergency, but it's not something that they want to make a career of, out of, but I felt as if I was at my best when everything went wrong and there was crisis that needed my skill set and and um and look at a lot of people have my skill set but i just felt a zone of comfort there i could again you know i'll repeat myself a bit but i, I felt like i could think under pressure i was in a, i felt innovative under pressure if someone was uh, you know because in ems you get all kinds of crazy situations i have you know 
oodles of stories uh, about, you know, uh, taking my equipment on an ATV deep in the woods, not knowing what you're going to get into, <laughs> diving underwater to go find people in cars. Um, wow. You know, you get thrust into situations where you, you challenge yourself. And in the end, you get to rescue people. You really, really do get to save a life. And that's to take nothing away from all the other specialties that, that impact life in all kinds of ways. But the acuity of saving a life in the moment really spoke to me. And I know that, you know, you could look at any physician, right? You, a, a family physician who is excellent in his job is saving lives. You know, I, I mean, it's the long game in, in a lot of cases. And sometimes it's the immediate diagnosis or early diagnosis of a, of a cancer or a heart attack. But for me, I felt that acuity mostly when I was in an emergency. And so I think that was, I was almost addicted to that and still am to some way. I mean that in the best of terms. Right. Where I am self-actualized in those moments. So you, you stayed with emergency medicine throughout medical school and then you went straight to residency after medical school. Yeah. Yes. So I went to the University of Massachusetts, which was a, a pretty competitive residency to get in. So I was very lucky. And the reason why I, I really loved it, not only is it you know near my hometown, at that point, there was really only a few medical uh, emergency medicine residencies in Massachusetts. I think it was UMass and um, Bay State Medical Center had a, a residency. And I I think there was a combined Harvard residency as well, but it was rather new. And UMass was the oldest residency in Massachusetts, and it was well-respected. And a few things uh, was what was really attractive. I, I think it had, a, it had a real reputation of being a residency where you were thrust immediately into, into the thick of things. Like they, they immersed you very quickly. There was not a lot of hand holding in this residency. And I, I felt like, oof, this is, this is where I'm going to learn the most. Uh, so for instance, in your second year residency, you are the only physician on, on the helicopter and you would have to fly throughout New England to pick up the sickest people in New England, either from the highway or from some other remote area or from other hospitals. And sometimes you would fly to a critical access hospital or an urgent care hospital where the patient was unintubated, uh, had no procedures done on them, but we clearly recognized that they needed an academic medical center. And you would have to perform those procedures either there or in the air. And that was a challenge that I just found too, I, I, I don't know, too uh, exciting to, uh, <laughs> to not, uh, not, not try and uh, be, be a part of. And so UMass was uh, an obvious choice for me. Tell tell so uh, I think a lot of folks probably not uh, some probably a lot of people who listen to this podcast understand the difference between medical school and residency but just give me 30 seconds on what what's the kind of structure of education there um what's happening yeah. sure so you know uh, just as review in, in medical school you have 2 years of really classroom didactics with some workshops and then in the second two years, you uh, are doing clinicals, but you're really observing at, at those two years. You, you really feel like you're the last in line to do anything. And there's a fellow and a resident and everybody yeah, on the pecking order. You're, per, you're pretty low in the totem pole. And so you're doing a lot of observing and, and, and helping and doing some histories and stuff. Um, but in residency, when you get chosen to be in the residency, one you are actually a doctor. So you've graduated medical school. So now the onus of the responsibility and the accountability are on you. So there's a gravity to your role that you did not have in medical school. And so that sets the stage for uh, what I would call the most grueling apprenticeship designed, uh, you know, sort of, you know, from an industry standpoint, the most grueling apprenticeship ever designed, which basically puts you at the tip of the spear under an apprentice, but doing the majority of the work for 120, 140 hours a week and being put in a responsible position where you are taking care of multiple patients at once in your specialty. So in emergency medicine, you 
focus on the emergency department. Like you, you spend most of your time in emergency department. I'll give you my, my, the classic schedule I had was 12 hour days for six days a week. And on the last day, I would fly on the helicopter overnight. So it would be a 24 hour day uh, on the last day of the six days. And then you had two days of rest and then you would flip into 12 hours. You, you know, you would start at seven o'clock and end at seven in the morning. So, and you would do that for six days. So it was six days on essentially one and a half days off. And you would be immersed in so many encounters that the idea is, you know, that's how you build your experience. The more patience you see, the more quickly and more astutely you'll be able to evaluate, diagnose, and treat folks who have emergency conditions. And, and, and getting as much of that as possible helps you with pattern recognition so that you can become an efficient emergency physician. So you know what someone who is having a heart attack looks like or someone who has a bowel obstruction, what do they look like? Or someone, even the very uh, basics of recognizing who looks sick and who doesn't look sick. Because if, if there's one thing in EMS I, 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 I was uh, ahead of the game on when I got to medical school is from you know, seven or eight years of doing EMS, I knew who, I knew who looked sick. And mm. that's a, I know that sounds so easy, but it, you know, trying to figure out, is someone having some mild anxiety? Is someone on the, on the death's door or someone in between? Um, that's, that's a subtle, uh, that's a, a nuanced view of a patient that takes a long time, I think, for a, a good physician to develop. And so in residency, you are immersed in that. Now, I know, you know, since I've been out of school, there's been restrictions on the amount of hours. But nonetheless, 80 hours is still a lot of time to over and over and repetitively see patients. Now, in residency also, you um, do rotations as well, but you do rotations with the responsibility of a doctor. And so when you're on the trauma service, I mean, I'll give you a, for instance, I was, uh, trauma was 24 on and 24 off. So you would work 24 hours seeing patients mainly, uh, in the trauma bay. And then you would follow them up to the ICU and to the general medical floors and until discharge. And, and it was a, at UMass, it was a constant flow of trauma patients. So at night I would be the only physician taking care of 30 people on a ventilator. And that's a lot, uh, just for those who are in context, um, an average ICU might have, 10, 12 patients, I would be taking care of uh, four or five ICUs at a time. Mm -hmm. So you have that responsibility and you need to really understand how to prioritize, how to make sure you're responsive, to be able to think when you're tired and overwhelmed, to multitask, and also to keep your wits about you from a clinical sense. And so that's a, a, a gauntlet that I think a lot of us go through when we have you know, rotations that require that much physical and mental uh, uh, energy. But, uh, you know, you, it's hard to learn those things I just mentioned without going through it. And then we went through pediatrics because it's part of emergency medicine. So I did six weeks of pediatrics, you know, weeks of imaging and, and reading x-rays and weeks of um, obstetrics and gynecology because uh, it, it, the, it, the emergency room takes all covers. And right. so I went through each one of those over the course of three years, but more and more during those three years, the majority of your work becomes more and more the emergency department until the very end you're basically working full-time in the emergency room. And, and probably the, the latter part of my third year was spent mostly in the emergency room, but the rotation still remains. Does that make, make sense? Yeah, that ab yeah absolutely. So sure? I, I want to ask you, you mentioned working through and having to make clinical decisions kind of in periods of basically you've been on for like maybe 24 hours and, and now you've, you're, you're still on and you've got to make these clinical decisions in a kind of a condition of exhaustion. What's the benefit of that? Like, what's the benefit of pushing residents to that sleep deprivation kind of exhaustion and still having to make clinical, you know, important clinical decisions? Why is that built into almost every residency that I'm aware of? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think people struggle on that because it's a philosophical question. It's a patient safety question. Right. And it's a, uh, 
character building and clinical question as well. I mean, there's so many facets to that. I mean, so, obviously, again, it's important enough that that despite the fact that, like you just indicated, it, there is a patient safety component, but it must, but it's got to be important enough that the that the practice has remained for for decades. You know, yeah, that that yeah. that happens, right? So, so what's the training so, so benefit? I would, yeah, I would answer. I think the primary driver of that is the sheer amount of information that needs to be incorporated as a resident is, uh, is, is overwhelming. I mean, uh, you know, technologies, diagnoses, uh, diseases, uh, all kinds of different therapies, they are being produced every day and trying to consume all that in such limited time, I think has led to this uh, sort of a uh, funnel, like the scheduling of, of, of folks. And at the same time, Knowing that the more people you see, the more patients you see, really, I, I think the better prepared you are to be a, um, you know, a, a, a physician mm-hmm. in your field. Right. It is very difficult to replicate thousands and thousands of patient encounters in such limited time. And so what's, what has happened is that um, given that there's been some restrictions on the amount of hours, residencies have gone to four years instead of mm-hmm. three years. Mm-hmm. So, so in, in some way, you know, try, still trying to replicate the ingraining of patterns of, of patients. That, that's the workaround for it once you restrict the hours to, to actually just roll the years out further. So a lot of emergency programs have gone to four years. So... I would say that that's the main goal is to absolutely make sure that each and every physician has as much exposure to patient, patient diseases, patient, uh, you know, situations that they can develop a rapid acumen. I don't know how else to explain that acumen that, that when they're in front of a patient, they have the experience of knowing what that patient is telling them so that they can rapidly diagnose and treat that person. And I don't think there's any real substitute other than, than the constant repetitiveness of seeing similar patients through your career. So I think that's one. On the other side of that is patient safety. And I completely concur that exhaustion can um, affect decision-making, memory retrieval, there's been some studies that show that, you know, maybe procedural wise, you, you can keep your skills up. And, but I think it's, it's pretty well known now that exhaustion in highly in industries where you need to be highly reliable is it, it goes against uh, safety. And so there's the conundrum, right? There's the wicked problem yeah. where, um, you know, knowledge and, and uh, uh, procedures and, and devices are coming out day by day. And how do you possibly educate someone to be uh, an expert in their field when their field is changing and you have limited, this limited amount of time. So I think that th- that's, that's been the, the trend uh, to, to really try and balance exhaustion against uh, the needs to learn. And, and uh, you know, I don't think we all have it figured out yet. I mean, I just, I, you know, having had a lot of conversations with a lot of different physicians who have gone through particularly like internal medicine, family medicine, EMS, kind of those kinds of programs, there's always kind of this story of I did a 36 hour shift and I was, you know, 30 hours into it and I'm having to make these complex decisions. And it strikes me that there's almost like a cultural crucible that's built into this that's beyond that. It's almost like, this is part of your initiation into the, into the field. Um, is that, yeah. is that a fair, I mean, like, is there a piece there that's like, we're going to, this is a little bit of like hazing too. Like there's a, and, and a part of it is to, to show, I mean, like, like my experience in the military is we're going to exhaust you. And then we're going to make you function under conditions of exhaustion to show you that you can test whether you can still draw on those skills. It, 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 that seems to me maybe a piece of it too. Is yeah. that accurate? I, I, look at, I, I'm not, I would not deny that. I would say that the, (laughs) I would say this, I would say that the origin of it has been, as I said, you know, the more patient encounters you have, 
you will be a better doctor because you will have better acumen. Yeah. Now, does it become a does it become culturalized that well if I did it you have to do it or right. you know this is the way we uh, break you down? I, I would say there's elements of that definitely, and, and it also depends on who um, who you're learning under, you know. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you that I've uh, a lot of toxic experiences in medicine as well. And I've had uh, mostly they've been fantastic. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. there's a certain toxicity that still exists with, um, you know, fellows who are um, overseeing residents who are overseeing uh, first year residents who are overseeing medical students. And that element you just talked about, you know, well, we're going to do it because, you know, this, this is how you build work ethic or mm -hmm. um, this is how you build resilience in people. Um, I do or think maybe how you wash some people a, out, right? I mean, so you maybe you wash some people out too, be. right? Like, you know, that's, yep. that's you yep. can't handle this. You can't hang. You're out. out of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how right. bad do you want this? Right. Yeah. 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 I, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to, uh, uh, paint a picture that looks like, Oh yeah. You, you know, you do it because this is a hazing or like you said, a crucible. I do think there was good intent as to yeah. why physicians need to work so much. However, I do think that can be, um, that can be a bastardized to some extent given, you know, certain situations and, 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 and everybody's really, everybody's experience is going to be different in that. Yeah. But you're right. There is an element of that that I think exists there's some of it's myth, some of it's real, and then is everything in between. But yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good point to make. Uh, and I think the industry has been trying to police itself on that, uh, particularly over the last few years where they've put um, some pretty, really, really strict restrictions uh, over the, um, the time uh, that, uh, you know, that residents can be expected to work in, which I think has led to a lot of good. Uh, now, the, the result of that, I will also tell you that residents are coming back out less prepared yeah. and that's something that organizations need to take on. So for instance, uh, an emergency physician who's come out with only 80 hours of experience and didn't go through the gauntlet may have uh, not honed their skills or may look at, I'm, I'm talking in general here. There's some, mm -hmm. there's, there's fantastic yeah, yeah. physicians coming out, but um, may need uh, even, I would say more oversight when they get out into, uh, you know, their, and really practice their occupation. And so I think a lot of organizations are finding that the residents are um, uh, well prepared, but less prepared than they were before. And that's led to, um, you know, a lot of um, accommodations in, in, in hospitals and doctor's offices and, and, and whatnot to make sure that graduating resident is fully prepared and, and uh, how they assess them and, and uh, oversee them has changed uh, down the road. So I, I bring up the the topic of the kind of cultural crucible in, in a it, because our conversations have have been around teaching physicians leadership and and you have talked when well, I've seen you talking to to physicians who are endeavoring to to take on these new roles talking about kind of some of the some of the learning that they have done cultural and cultural assumptions and kind of the hierarchical nature of medical training and how that creates challenges for trying to transition into or from from a leadership role as a clinician to an organizational leadership role and and so i and you mentioned some toxic things it's not necessarily i don't know that that's necessarily toxic the the issues are are can you talk a little bit about kind of some of that of your experience in medical training and and how it shapes physicians thinking about leadership that you have looked at over the years to to think about what do we have to unlearn or or learn differently to make that transition to leadership from your own experiences maybe that has been um, I think the focus of a lot of my career in in developing physicians as leaders and and um, you know, just to sort of start from the, from the very beginning, we go through an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And that apprenticeship requires us to focus nearly all of our energy on the patient in front of us. And to be absolutely, the, la the buck stops with you. I mean, that's what you're told. The buck stops with you. So don't trust anybody else's evaluation. 
uh, I remember being on um, on a vascular service, right? You know, they, uh, a service that takes care of the uh, uh, arteries and, and veins of, of folks. And, and um, it's a tough service to be on because a lot of those folks have very chronic diseases and the operations and procedures you do on them are high risk. And I remember rounding on a few and I, you know, and, and one of my jobs as the resident was to go and get all the vital signs. You're like the gopher. So you go and get all the vital signs and um, I probably had 30 people and, and the, the vascular surgeon comes over and he says, okay, uh, give me the vitals. And um, very curtly, and, and I kind of go, he goes, and I, I start spouting them off. And uh, he said, did you take those yourself? And I said, no, I got them off the nurse's note. And he stomps his feet and goes, so you, you just trust those. You didn't take them yourself. How do you know those are right? And I, it, was, it, it was irrational. Even though I'm saying it right now, it was an irrational ask of me. Because there's 30 people. I've been up all night, you know, pounding out fires. And what he's saying is don't trust anybody else. You need to go and take these yourself and you're accountable for them. And I think it was an irrational comment, but that's what the subtext was. So, uh, you know, we're taught that the buck stops with you, that don't trust anybody else but your own clinical acumen. Don't get railroaded into thinking something's different when it isn't. We're taught that it's all about the patient in front of you. And you, you are the captain who needs to advocate for that one patient, no matter what the cost because that's your responsibility. So it's a very singular focus of, of, of your sort of career on, on a single patient. And I guess the other piece of it is um, that when you graduate from medical school, some of us are really well prepared, but some aren't, to, be, to have the top license in the room. And when you are managing a team of people, sometimes that license is you, know, you need to say, uh, you know, we need to do X or um, you need to exert your directiveness because you know what's maybe best for the patient. But that is at the, that is at the expense of not allowing the team to fully inform you of what else might be going on. And so some physicians, I believe, use what I call the authority gradient to get things done. And, and that is, is absolutely necessary in some moments. And in many, and I would say most moments, that is something that is uh, erosive of good team culture. And so we don't balance that very well when we get out because that's not what we're, simply not what we're taught. I would also say that even now, I, I think there's a lot of talk about educating physicians in team dynamics leadership, emotional intelligence, team emotional intelligence. And although I hear and I read a lot about it, every time I get in front of residents, I'll ask sometimes, you know, I, well, not every time, but most times I'll ask, how many of you have had education in, in uh, a team dynamics or being part of a, a team? And inevitably, I get one or no one who, who, who raises their hands in, in, in large groups. And so it, it, it lets me know that there's still a lot of this sort of traditional focus on being an apprentice. And so I think the difficulty then becomes when physicians are pulled out of the audience to be leaders. And in some ways, we, we're leaders of our clinical team. And, and that's, that's almost always the case. So when you're in the OR, you decide what procedure is going to be done. You decide what treatment will be necessary. You decide the post-op care and you, you know, decide when to discharge the patient. So you're leading that team. There's no doubt about it. But what the organization often needs is someone who can lead with, with a, a more broad picture of what the needs are of a department, what the needs are of a, uh, a division, or maybe even what the needs are of the entire organization. And when we get out of our sphere of that clinical lead, we, I think, come to that position with not the right tools. So instead of someone who uh, works through emotional intelligence and collaboration, you may, get, you may be very used to using your authority gradient. So you run into issues with there or rather than saying, well, I want to, we want to be focused on the safety of all of our patients. And how do you 
take a you know kind of a utilitarian view of that instead of saying no 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 we need to we need to get this for this one patient right now and 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 it's hard for physicians to reconcile that i think and and, and frankly just some of the toxic lessons we've learned and we've come up through also um come out in you know lack of collaboration self interest and that is not uh, to say that the personality of somebody is encompassing that it's 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 how they were taught during their apprenticeship and so applying those tools to a organization and to team building and to building psychological safety and emotional intelligence and all of that that's necessary to run an organization because you have to influence and change people that needs to be l- learned i'm not necessarily saying the skills of a physician need to be unlearned but when they get thrust into a context of getting beyond their sphere of of just the clinical team and into uh, you know really broad teams teams that are meant to influence procedures in the hospital or teams that are talking about patient safety or the patient experience and when you get into those spheres of, of influencing other folks to change then you can't bring those skill sets to that context you will fail as a leader. And I will say that a lot of physicians get a really bad rap on, on leaders, uh, on leading in those situations because they haven't been taught the skills to lead in those situations and they fall back on their, uh, what they know. And we've become known as hotheads. We've become known as obstinate, self-interested could go on about the different cliches. Right. But again, I think systematically that's how it's, it's worked out. I want to, run more with that because I want to talk about your your professional experiences post-residency, but I want to ask one more physician-specific question. And that is, when did you know you were a physician? So I mean, it's like a, that's a oh. huge identity kind of, it's a very important role in society. When did you feel comfortable looking in the mirror and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Meehan? <laughs> that is, that is such a, uh, a, uh, <laughs> Interesting question. I, I mean, you know, not, not a lot of people will ask that. Um, look, I, I, I was very uncomfortable when I, when I was a doctor, when I left, when I graduated medical school. Right. Cause technically I, you're a doctor. I was, at, you, they hand you the was, degree. Doctor, Congratulations. Right. Doctor, Dr. Meehan. I, I was so uncomfortable. I said to people, no, no, don't call me doctor. Call me Neil. <laughs> and, and I, uh, I, you know, look at that. It's not serving the patient. Because it's almost saying, yeah, look at, I know you think I'm a doctor, but I'm really not. So I'm going to reduce the confidence in you uh, that you have in me and, and create anxiety. You know, like it, it could have the opposite effect. But I, I, I was so uncomfortable with that, that um, I didn't understand, uh, you know, the gravity of maybe my own license. Yet, I think that I, I would say it took me a good year to really have it sink in that everybody in my society, at least, uh, looks at me as a doctor now. I mean, my identity, because I've been through this mental boot camp for four or five years, and because I've been so passionate about it, my identity is a a doctor. I mean, you can call me a, I don't know, bad baseball player, or you can say I have poor taste in music. I'll, I'll debate you. Do not ever call me a bad doctor. That really, <laughs> really pokes my identity, my, my yeah. id. And so um, I think many of us feel that uh, our identity is, I, I would, you know, look at, I, it's hard for me to even go in social circumstances without being called doctor. My, my nickname on my softball team is Doc Hollywood. Don't ask me why. But <laughs> I'm just saying. I get the doc part. Is, I'm going to have to hear about the Hollywood part yeah. at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they were trying to, there was some kind uh, of comparison to some doctors uh, on, on TV uh, and blah, okay, blah, blah. Okay. That's a whole other <laughs> podcast, Mark. All right. um, so, uh, you know, I have trouble walking in the parties. I, um, you know, in all kinds of uh, other social situations, even my neighbors, Hey, doctor, how you doing? Or oftentimes I'll even get introduced as a doctor. Mm-hmm. Uh, even in music now in my band, like I, I have to keep telling the, 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 the leader of the band, please 
stop introducing me as a doctor. I don't want to be known <laughs> as that. And yet I think that's the expectation that society has on us. And, and I'm okay with it now. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm kind of joking about the music thing, but I, um, I, I've learned not only to live it, but to embrace it. And that's, that's been a journey. So you said about a year, was there a, I mean, was there a patient encounter you had, or was it just kind of the accumulation of people looking at you and saying, doctor? Yeah, that's a, that's another great question. I, I don't think I have a good answer for that, Mark. I, okay. I, I, all I could say is my recollection is I remember the anxieties of it when people were calling me doctor. And I remember me saying, oh, no, 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 don't call me doctor. I feel more comfortable with it. Um, I would say that it was like osmosis and, and yeah. eventually it became my own internal culture. And then I would say sometime probably by two or three years, I was solidly embracing my identity. So I don't know if there was a seminal moment. Mm. Okay. So you graduated from UMass and began practicing at Lawrence General Hospital in Lawrence, Massachusetts as an emergency medicine physician and you were there for a number of years and pretty from, you know, from my understanding, pretty rapidly moved into leadership roles, ultimately serving as the chief medical officer for the hospital. Tell me a little bit about kind of your evolution and when you made that transition from being a clinician to wanting to take on leadership roles and kind of, how did it, how did you wind up being the chief medical officer? Well, another um, long story that I'll, I'll try and uh, make short, but basically I did not go into medicine thinking I'll be in leadership or I'll be in administration or even if I wanted to be a director. And, and I had influences. You know, my father, he was chief of police by the time he had, you know, by the time he had uh, retired. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I did sort of understand a little bit about the challenges of leadership, but we certainly didn't go into medicine for it. And I did, I did have a penchant for change. And I did, I was always one who was never satisfied with the status quo. And so what it led to me is going into the, the chief of emergency medicine at the time and complaining a lot about the way we did things, because I could see the inefficiencies. We knew they were inefficient yet, you know, it's like the paint peeling off the wall. Eventually you stop looking at it. And so I would be the one who looked at it and say, we need to fix this. And I, I, you know, I wasn't, I don't think I was just going into the complaint for the sake of complaining. I had some real uh, improvements that I thought I, I, I could affect. And so if you complain enough, people will put you in a lead role uh, if you're a <laughs> physician, because yeah. they're just like, okay, this guy's interested. Maybe we can get some horsepower out of him, put him in that role. And so um, basically I became the assistant director. And I had given, been given some rote, like can't get in too much trouble jobs, like through the schedule and, and a few other things. And then um, I did have a few projects I wanted, uh, I wanted to take on. And some of them went extraordinarily bad um, <laughs> because I, although, although I wanted to fix things, I had no idea how to fix things within an organization. I didn't understand process improvement. I didn't understand change management. I didn't understand emotional intelligence of teams. And therefore, I, um, I probably tried to do it my way or the highway type of uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And that got me into some hot water. And then I said, there's got to be a way, better way to do it. So there was a seminal moment where I learned, okay, I am ill-equipped to be in a leadership role. And how do I get equipped? So you, you actually went and got a, a master's degree at Harvard in, I want to say it was, was it public health or with a focus on management? Yeah. So I went to the uh, Harvard School of Public Health for the physician executive you know, development program, uh, which mm -hmm. I was blessed to another, you know, I, I feel so lucky to have gotten in there. And I was with some really, really influential uh, emergency physicians and physicians from around the world. Um, because Harvard, um, it, it's such a, a sought after program and, uh, I was lucky to get in and, and that was a transformational event for me. I really felt like, um, not only was I educated, but I was applying it as I went. And that's part of the way Harvard works. You know, you, 
you begin to work on projects in your home base right away and and with with uh so you were still at the hospital of, yeah you were still at lawrence still at hospital, working yeah. full-time and doing this on this uh, at night and going to school yeah and right, getting right, a master's okay. degree too yeah. i i know it, 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 <laughs> I, I i'm a glutton for punishment yeah, there you go and, and you know before that i i did have some I did, I did, I um, did what's called the Amy at 10 by 10, which was the first thing that ever introduced me to organizational behavior. And that's a program that was started by the federal government. I was lucky enough to get a grant. It was only a one year program certificate. And I got it in biomedical informatics because I was really interested in uh, EMR technology and, and whatnot. And so I had a little bit of leadership, but that was really where I learned about how to be a leader. So what was it like? So you started learning these leadership skills. What was it like rising through the ranks in, in the same organization? I mean, you moved for folks who are not familiar with this, you know, you moved from kind of departmental assistant, you know, like assistant manager all the way up to the C-suite as the chief medical officer. Um, What was it like making those transitions uh, through the organization? Was there, was it challenging because people knew you as, as, just a rank and file physician as you moved up or sure. was there an advantage to that or kind of both? Both. So, uh, well, I think physicians have an added element of challenge or, or, or advantage that they need to display in order for them also to lead other physicians, which is I do think you have to be respected for your clinical work. It's really hard. I mean, look at, as physicians, we aspire to be great physicians. Um, and we, um, revere physicians who show tremendous clinical skills. And so if you are, um, respected in your clinical skills, you are one step ahead when it comes to leading clinicians. And, and, and the, my route I took is uh, I was uh, a chief medical officer, a chief medical information officer first, and then chief medical officer. And I was leading physicians, basically. And so I think I had built up a good reputation of being a skillful clinician. And so that was a good step forward for me. I also, have, I, I think I, I've had a, a good reputation for being a pretty emotionally intelligent person. So, you know, sort of understanding the conditions of physicians and what they're going through, being a physician myself, and also being able to communicate and sort of, I, I think, have a general control over my, my own emotions during conflict and whatnot. I think I had some elements that were giving me an advantage in the beginning. I would say that definitely those those skills were challenged when it came to really trying to hold my colleagues accountable. I think um, there was a very big challenge with the chief of one of one of the departments uh, that I uh, was immersed in almost immediately. I had excellent mentors at the time, which which really helped me get my uh, legs under me when I was really starting out pretty green in that CMO position. And I think that the challenges that were before me were exactly like you described. Look, I went from a colleague to uh, really a boss and and trying to hold everybody accountable who wasn't even in my department. I mean, that was really the biggest challenge is I can understand the emergency physician mindset. I understand their challenges and I've lived their experience. But when you go to hold um, pediatricians or... um, surgeons or other folks accountable for providing high quality medicine, which everybody wants to do, but there's, there's times when you need to correct a course that was really difficult in getting my confidence. It took a few years to get into a mindset where I felt I, I had my own professional confidence to do that. And so that uh, came with experience. So while you were at Lawrence, you had kind of the seeds of the what has evolved into the New Hampshire Physician Leadership Development Program that's co-sponsored sponsored here at UNH. What was it that made you start doing this course? So what I realized, and this is the plight of many hospitals, that in the hospital I was at, prior to the one I'm at now, Exeter, mm-hmm. um, 
there was mainly a volunteer medical staff, meaning that um, most of the physicians who came and worked in the hospital were not employed by the hospital. They were there because it was their local hospital and they chose to do their uh, work there. But they had they were small businessmen and, and women who worked out in the community and who had choice of coming to your hospital or other hospitals. And, and that's the way many hospitals work. And so, so those small business women and men, they are not beholden to the hospital, you know, outside of the basics of safety and, and medical records and abiding by, you know, uh, OR times and all of that. Um, but they um, leading, leading a group like that it, it is difficult. And also the previous administration had put no energy that I could see into building a physician leadership layer that I could delegate anything to. So what I ended up being was really a one man band trying to lead a multi-million dollar organization without any way to delegate or, or, or really uh, stretch out the uh, uh, you know, span of control, meaning that I had no bench of physician leaders to reach into that I could rely on. And that was mainly because the organization had not put any effort into developing them. And frankly, I'm not sure if the previous administration even believed in physicians as, as genuine leaders, at least in, from the administrative side. Yeah. So I said, let me, I, I'm going to need to develop that bench because I can't live like this. <laughs> I can't <laughs> be the only person doing the work. I'm going to get a divorce. So I, um, I ended up, really, really through a lot of work at Harvard designing, well, let me go backwards a little bit. Well, let me start from the beginning. I did look at uh, third parties who really offer leadership courses. They'll uh, do online courses. They'll, they will uh, uh, deliver the courses in person sometimes, but I found them to be pretty superficial and um, I found them to be really expensive. And then you can send physicians to like leadership boot camp. But when they got back, they were really no better off because they they had basically piled up all the emails, they had re- rescheduled their offices. And so when they got back, they were just inundated again with all the clinical uh, work and the, the leadership training had sort of dissolved. And so I didn't see a sustainable way to develop leaders in a way that was economically sustainable unless I just built it myself and I felt like I had talent in the organization. And if I sort of brought a physician experience to it, then I could design something that would help me develop leaders and make it sustainable and that they would uh, give back to the organization. And that I I just felt like there was a hunger out there for that because at the same time, I know leaders were frustrated by the lack of engagement shown by administration. And so you had both sides frustrated with each other. And, and really the common link was, the, was to really provide leadership training and development for the physicians so that both entities would, be, would feel uh, comfortable engaging each other. So I first designed a, um, a, a two-year course that really, I, I, I kind of focused on the, I would call them the sort of soft skills and hard skills and I sort of focused on things like leadership governance, quality regulations, rules of medical executive committee. And what I realized is that what I really need is engaged team leaders and change agents. So over the course of a few iterations, the course rapidly changed to, I would say, a true leadership course where we look at. Uh, ways to um, assess your personality and do self-reflection and then build upon that and and turn that into um, uh, courses on emotional intelligence and how do you use emotional intelligence to influence people and to be more successful? And then how do you build teams with your emotional intelligence so that the team has a psychological safety and then they can do great work together and they understand, you know, how to interface with other teams. And then from there, build, you know, because teams change things. How do you manage change in an organization and how do you manage the emotions of change? And then from there, um, because change leads to conflict, how do you deal with conflict? Because frankly, physicians are, I find us to be a group uh, who's 
fairly conflict avoidant. And so I guess what I'm saying is I really began to focus on the interpersonal and interrelational skills of uh, physicians to train them to be better leaders. And then the second half of the course is really more about the hard skills, you know, quality improvement. That's a skill every leader should really know deeply. And a big gap was finance, Mark, and that's how we met, where physicians are oftentimes, you know, to be the ultimate leader, you want to be the owner and operator of your, um, of your department or your division or your team. And that means you have to understand budgets and, 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 and budget variances and how do you create a budget? And then in order to understand if you want to go and ask for like, well, I, I'm leading a change, but I need a capital. I, I would like to get into robotic surgery. I would like to get the certain laser. How do you build a business plan around it? Like physicians, you know, we, we don't get that type of training uh, unless of course we had an alter, uh, an alternate life before our, our training started. And so we also covered that base as well. And, and I think over the years, it's, it's um, you know, getting talented individuals to train folks to understand how to make it sustainable within their organization, how to build projects that are meaningful to both them and the organization. And then finally, um, we, well, we were um, uh, one of the uh, participants in the Mass Compass Awards. We were nominated for uh, leadership and cultural change in Massachusetts. So at that point, I realized I was sort of on to something. And the other real outcome was that I saw the quality scores and the finances of the hospital begin to change for the better. And I, there were physicians leading efforts around the organization that cumulatively led to, I think, really great outcomes for the hospital. And it's hard to attribute all of that to uh, just physician training, but in the areas of quality and patient safety. And I really think we made a big, big difference. And so uh, when I came to New Hampshire, exit the hospital, you know, look at, we have great physicians, but there was not a lot of leadership development. I brought the program there. Uh, we had really successful cohorts. And by then the program, I think was really honed pretty well. And then at that point, I I sort of said, well, I, I, I talked to folks at UNH and at Mass Medical Society, and I brought together the Medical Society, UNH. At New Hampshire Medical Society, right? The Hospital Association. The, no, the, the, sorry, yeah, the New Hampshire Medical Society, the uh, New Hampshire Hospital Association and UNH. We got together and said, what if we created a sustainable program for f provider and physician leadership uh, in the state? And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, have some pretty open minds. And there was some bumps along the way. And now we're into our third cohort. And I think it's going great. Um, we've filled every cohort. So I, um, I, I really look towards the future of that as being, uh, I think, a platform for the whole state to really create leadership capacity in, in the healthcare industry in New Hampshire. Well, I've been excited to be a part of the program, and it's it's really great to get to know a lot of the physicians who are making trying, you know, learning these skills, and they're they're really energetic, and it's a lot of fun to work with, you know, very smart, uh, motivated individuals. So, so you mentioned you came to your current role as the chief physician executive for Exeter Health Resources back in 2016. Can you talk briefly about what is Exeter Health Resources, and what does a chief physician executive do? Yeah, so EHR is uh, an umbrella corporation that houses three affiliates. First, the hospital, which is a 100-bed hospital in Exeter. The core physician group, which has, I think, greater than 180 providers now uh, throughout the Seacoast area. And uh, a, a large uh, VNA called Rockingham VNA. Okay. And so what's your role as chief physician executive? What? And I understand it was a relatively new position when you took came and took on, took it on. What did the organization have in mind when they created the position and, and, then, and then brought you in to fill it? Yeah, I, that's a really good question because I answer this a lot. I think people mix this up with a chief medical officer position, and, and I want to say there's a lot of overlap. So first, uh, there are a lot of chief medical officers who are probably functioning as chief physician executives and, and vice versa. Uh, so the, the sort of... Um, Venn diagram is, is, is pretty overlapping. However, Exeter's case, what I know that they were looking for was a physician who could join the senior management team, 
who could be one, the, the voice of the physicians um, as far as uh, getting their influence and input from, a, from a, a lived experience into the senior management team and also helping with setting the strategy and the direction of the organization by, again, bringing in the skills of a physician who's also had leadership experience into the organization to add to the skill set of our already highly skilled senior management team, particularly given a few things. One is the you know, really the onslaught of, of population health and risk contracts. So having experience that in my previous organization, being in risk and being in an ACO and, and, and really working on population health, that was a skill set I think they were looking for. Also to develop the physician leaders, knowing that I had my previous experience with my leadership development. And then I think, honestly, the, the overall uh, expansion and, and change in the environment of competitors who are uh, were entering left and right through different technologies, through different retail platforms. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the organization was ready to begin to look at a different strategy. And I, I'm glad they thought it was important to have a physician join them for that strategic planning. That, in essence, is, is what I, I do. Uh, if I had to say one of my three focused areas, it would be to really put us on the map for quality. I want to be recognized for quality. And as you know, we've been a five-star Medicare hospital for over a year now. And that's been a, a, a great uh, improvement. That, that's that been a real uh, feather in our hat. Uh, and also we've, we've had a, a LeapFrog A score for more than a year. And so uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the quality goals that I had have be- become come to fruition. Uh, on the other side, uh, in the population health, I wanted to make sure that we were ready to join an ACO, which we uh, eventually did. We also have taken on several risk contracts, which we've been uh, successful in so far. And then I, I really wanted to begin to bring leadership development so that we could be a physician-led organization. I don't mean from a, you know an administrative physician-led organization, but that the the organization can rely on physician leadership uh, when it comes to managing teams for process improvement throughout the organization. And so building that uh, strength is uh, one of the other things I focus on every day. What would you say are the skills and competencies necessary to become a chief physician executive of an organization like Exeter Health Resources? I think that I've already mentioned a lot of the skills that we teach in our course. So emotional intelligence, understanding how to build teams, understanding your own ability to deal with conflict because conflict, you know, we oftentimes see it as something counterproductive, but when you get up to the level of senior management, a conflict is the culture in a way, and and the conflict is productive, or at least in most teams, that's what we aspire to make it. So understanding uh, people's priorities, understanding where you have uh, overlap in those or understanding where you have differences in those, and then Understanding how to manage conflict, even interpersonal conflict, is such an important skill because there is not a day that I go through that doesn't involve some level of conflict. And I think through the years I've learned to embrace that, but I won't I won't admit to trying to be or, or trying to say I'm any type of expert. And it's still it's still something I'm learning uh, all the time. And I think you know a lot of the other things those 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 things you learn. I call it sort of through osmosis or through experience, those will come, you know, the, the things like you know, learning legal and, and regulatory uh, uh, nuances and learning how regulatory bodies audit the hospital and, and how strategy uh, plays out. And there's probably a myriad of other things I can talk about, but a talented individual will, will learn those uh, vicariously through the position. There's, there's just simply no playbook for this. So I would say if you go with the skills that I mentioned, you've already set yourself up for success. And especially you need to understand that your license as a physician gives you a certain credibility that nobody else has. And you can leverage that as a leader, as long as you're doing that in the context of what's best for the organization high emotional intelligence and understanding that collaboration and conflict, they go hand in hand. And if you, I think if you, if you approach it that way, you'll be successful. 
So just to wrap up, so talking about what it takes to be successful as a, as a chief physician executive, but kind of going back down the ladder a bit, uh, what advice do you give most often to physicians who are making that initial transition from being a clinician and, and, and granted physicians are, are leaders in their, in their own right as clinicians, but from that clinician role to the organizational leadership role. So what advice do you get, find yourself giving most often to people who are maybe taking on their first medical director job or something like that? I would say number one, find a mentor or find a coach. I think it can't be overestimated how important a trusted confidant who you believe is a good leader who you want to emulate at least, you know, the, the skills of leadership that you find someone who can interact with you and give you great advice on a regular basis. Uh, just a good mentor goes such a long way in helping you in your own personal development. Number two is I would say that treat leadership like you treat your own medical practice, that it's a uh, art and a science and that it is a, uh, it is something that requires lifelong learning and it's something that requires you to embrace as you do the passion of medicine. So finding moments where you can educate yourself in all those things I mentioned, change management and team building and good leadership. There's so much out there that's very accessible, but finding the time and the commitment to that, I think is really important to develop yourself and your leadership skills. And then finally, I would say, you know, be bold. If there's something someone is asking of you, give, give a lecture somewhere or can you lead this team? That's a leadership moment. And I think you should embrace that. And a lot of us may not. They may feel, oh, I'm not ready for that. Or, geez, you know, maybe someone else is better in that position than I am. Uh, I would say embrace it because that's the time when you're going to grow. And those are experiences that you are going to find priceless in aggregate as you begin to build your career in leadership. So those three pieces uh, I'll leave you with. I want to ask, you know me, my background is uh, I was a control, comptroller, CFO type for the in the military system. You know, when I look at physicians, physicians in leadership roles, I see a half a a half of an FTE or a full FTE, a very expensive FTE. So so sell me on why as an organization I should make that you know, if I, I'm not in one now, but if I was in a leadership, why should I uh, pay for a half an FTE to, for a physician to move over to a leadership role? Because it strikes me as that's a that's a big cost. So, so sell me on the on on that investment. So, uh, there's been several studies that have been out, and I won't say they're scientific, but they're mainly qualitative. But nonetheless, they come from really experienced organizations in the in the uh, leadership realm. And I think what's clear is that when an organization engages physician leadership, or sometimes it's called when an organization is physician led, they have better quality uh, indicators. They do better in population health and risk contracts. They are more sustainable financially and they grow faster than the competition. So, Physician leadership is an investment that I think is hard to measure in how many positive influences it will have on your organization. I would also say that it's not just an administrative leader that you get. It's someone who comes with proprietary knowledge of the field that you're actually administering. Knowledge that's been built over the course of 12, 13, 15 years. And for a physician to make the leap from their clinical journey in life to an administrative journey, that can be somewhat of a unicorn. And to embrace that and find out how to develop that, I think, is a blessing to any senior management team. So for those reasons, I think the investment in physician leadership is, is priceless in some cases. So let me let me leave you with this. So you've been a physician since 1994. You graduated medical school in 1994. What's been most gratifying about your journey as a physician? The most gratifying thing I've done is is really everything 
I think I've invested in physician leadership. I think there's a certain, there's a thrill that I get when I am able to impact the careers of other physicians in leadership and know that I've, I've set them on a journey on their own journey of developing themselves, developing themselves as leaders, because I know that that effect, that ripple effect will propagate throughout the organizations that they are involved in. And I think that's, um, that's inspiring to me. Um, that's self-actualizing to me. And that is the most gratifying thing that I do in my career. Neil, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again soon.